So, um, this morning's first talk is Machine Learning Engineering Principles with Python and MLflow by um, Nato Lalchande, who works for Juma World in Cape Town. Take it away. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Natu, and I'll be talking around machine learning engineering principles with Python and MLflow. It's basically a presentation around um, some research that I've done as part of uh, at the ML team at, the, at my company around different uh, machine learning platforms and tools and uh, approaches used out there in the industry and trying to play around with some of uh, the uh, platforms that are out there to solve uh, a couple of pain points that I will uh, explain just in a bit. Uh, yeah. So I work for Jumo, it's a fintech company, and we use machine learning and for, fi uh, for financial products. Uh, so the agenda is around, uh, it's basically the, the talk is divided in four parts. We'll be talking about uh, machine learning engineering pain points or machine learning pain points in general. Uh, and we'll do a small survey, a survey of a couple of best practices uh, of, of some companies that have published their machine learning architectures online, like Uber, and we'll also look at some Databricks architectures and uh, Airbnb and I think Facebook as well. Uh, and we'll try to extract from, from this initial research a couple of principles and uh, find ways to address some of the pain points, the normal pain points that data scientists com uh, complain about generally. And then I'll just uh, uh, show an example of usage of MLflow uh, in this context. So out of scope is a detailed review or specific algorithmic or data science solution. And it's definitely not a tutorial as well. So it's more a survey of tools and um, a set of notes, research notes and recommendations uh, on the ML engineering space. Cool. So uh, starting with the context of machine learning these days, so it's kind of easily accessible. So everyone can do a, an online course and realize that knows machine learning and uh, set up a Jupyter notebook and um, <laughs> solve big problems and make a lot of money probably for their companies. But <laughs> we generally know that the solutions generally don't scale and uh, there are a lot of issues with um, uh, particular novice data scientists that just want to put their Jupyter notebooks into production. So. Generally, things work very well in, 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 your, in, your, in your development environment, in your machine. Oh, yeah, you have this amazing 99% of accuracies able to uh, able to be, bring to the company a billion dollars in revenue on your Jupyter notebook and things like that. So, but these things need to go into production, and when you, you just move them to production without proper thought, like what we've found in the past from experience, it's just problems. So things don't work well, uh, APIs don't, sco don't scale correctly, so we went around and looked for a couple of tools. Another second uh, important pain point is data entanglement. So basically, I don't know if it's clear yet, definitely not clear, so data comes from everywhere and <laughs> there is no control uh, over like data traceability or what type of data generated that particular model, or uh, sometimes like what data is being used for scoring if this data is the same as the data used for modeling. Those. So this is a common pain point uh, that the industry faces in general. Another important pain point is keeping tracking of your experiments in machine learning. So basically your models and you do improvements and you want to trace back and understand which parameter generate that uh, amazing accuracy or, uh, or, or the metrics that you want to optimize or your log loss. And it's, def it's definitely very, uh, it's not trivial to keep track of the context in order to reproduce your machine learn learning model for production. And also like it's 
very important to keep track of important metrics like underfitting and overfitting while you are doing model development. So this is also a, an important uh, pain point. Uh, the question is how do you handle this, uh, these issues? So machine learning engineering might come into rescue is basically that uh, intersection uh, between uh, backend engineering, data science, and DevOps and data engineering. So different companies call this role different things. So in my own company, we generally call it data engineering, but we are morphing into machine learning engineering just to uh, keep up to date with industry best practices. Uh, so basically, it's, it's a, a practice or a role that understands a bit of backend, has uh, information around uh, uh, continuous integration, deployments, and obviously data engineering, talking about your big data, uh, how to manage data with Spark and uh, Stream, uh, Kafka, things like that, and obviously has some knowledge of data science, receives, receives inputs from data scientists' models uh, to be deployed in production. Uh, so just to give help build up the context of this process, so this is like uh, an idealized uh, workflow for machine learning. So you define your business problem, your context, uh, your prototype, and on your left side uh, is when you start moving uh, things into production. So basically, the machine learning engineer starts uh, collaborating uh, basically from the the final phases of prototyping when uh, your model has proved itself to be reliable and potentially uh, productionizable. And uh, this is actually a Uber, uh, like Uber approach for the machine learning lifecycle. And these are kind of like the four different steps. So you define your problem, and from there, like the set of gates up to prototype where your data scientists actually try to prove the model. And then, obviously, production, where you start having uh, information like uh, bringing up uh, data engineers, machine learning engineers. And obviously, uh, uh, after this is in production, you need to uh, close the loop and monitor and get, get insights from your model. Uh, another context definition for machine learning engineering. So this is a very recent uh, article around uh, from uh, Martin Fowler. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain with a bit more detail a couple of things uh, down, the, down the line. So it's trying to uh, put the machine learning engineer in context of the machine learning life cycle. So when you receive a model and you need to uh, deploy into production to extract value out of the model, and the data engineers, although it's a very small block, but it's actually probably the most complex block is the block responsible for preparing, acquiring the data, preparing the data, and ensuring the data has quality to produce uh, good models so the data scientist can uh, move on. Uh, so this is also, again, uh, giving a bit more context why we actually need machine learning engineering on wh while deploying uh, uh, a machine learning system. Is, this is a famous article by, I think, Dan Schooley from uh, Google Research. So, as you guys can see, like the ML code is just a very small percentage of all this process. I actually had a lot of problems with data scientists in our company because they really didn't like this because the rest of the work is basically for data engineers and machine learning engineers. So, but in reality, like creating the machine learning code is just like on the machine learning system, developing the model is just a small part of the problem. So you actually have configuration. Uh, obviously, the system needs to be configurable in some way if you're deploying in multiple locations. You need to do data collection, reliable data collection. Your pipelines need to work correctly. You need to generate features. And each of these squares have their own tools in general. And you also need to manage your infrastructure, like from a DevOps perspective. And you, have, you need to have a serving inf infrastructure, and obviously you need to monitor. Uh, uh, please feel free to ask any questions. Like I'm, fi I'm fine with questions here as well in the middle of the session. So after this, like a couple of principles after this, like so, uh, after some initial research on, on a couple of papers and a couple of architectures that we'll delve into a bit more detail soon. 
So one of the things that we, we, we have tried to extract was this machine learning engineering principles that we should um, try to look on the tooling or on the approaches for new projects. So one of the important uh, takeaways from our initial research was uh, taking this software engineering approach and a platform view of the ML functioning. So you produce the output of your ML functioning, obviously, if it goes through all the life cycles, if you discover that the model has value uh, to give to production. Obviously, it's taking a software engineering approach to productionization phase and even for model development. So to aid uh, the data scientists, you can create multiple tools to aid uh, the uh, model development process. Um, so uh, another important thing is to have re re reproducible and re reliable model management. This is around uh, what we talked about, uh, uh, the fact that like having traceability of models, which model worked and why, particularly these days around like uh, when you need to ha understand a bit more why your machine learning models took specific decisions. So models are produced from data and having this artifact that contains the data and the model in itself is critical to be able to trace back to the reason why your model is taking some decisions. Um, yeah, and actually data scientists, they really need uh, like tooling and infrastructure to move fast. So these are kind of the guiding principles, the initial guiding principles that we extracted from um, this initial uh, research and looking around for what was out in the industry. And now I'll delve into a couple of uh, examples and uh, that will just uh, 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 stress the software engineering approach that's taken in the industry in general. So I spent a lot of time, uh, not a lot of time, some time, uh, looking at a tool called uh, uh, Michelangelo from Uber. It's public and uh, available online, so we looked at the papers and uh, blog articles and videos and things like that. Yeah, so this is uh, the Uber approach to machine learning engineering and, uh, and machine learning platforms. So they basically have like a pretty beefy software platform with multiple components. So this is all available online. If you Google for it, you can find the very same image. So basically, the idea of this platform is to serve their army of data scientists to rapidly productionize models and deploy models with less friction possible. Because at the end of the day, as you might know, like data scientists, a very fast iteration approach. You need to be able, a lot of models like you can't actually figure out if they work just in dev. You need to put them out in the wild because this is the moment where you have like real data. So this platform enables Uber to actually rapidly deploy models. And more than anything, like it's highly scalable as you can see from the different components. So I'll start with uh, the general approach. So they have like an online and an offline approach uh, and an offline component. The offline component, it's where your model training happens, your data preparation of batch data happens. And uh, the online approach is when you want to serve your model. So on the, basically the first step is uh, acquiring the data. So the data can be from Kafka or from a date, uh, like on the online approach, basically, most of the times we will be talking about uh, kind of real-time systems or event-based systems where you can get events from uh, your, uh, let's say, ride-sharing app, like uh, uh, requesting a ride or, or, or canceling a ride. So these events do come in real-time, and they send these events to the stream engine. So on the stream engine, they actually uh, try to implement a lot of the business logic around the feature generation. And, and there is like a, an important problem in machine learning. So you need to be able to do the same processing that you do with your training data, with your inference data. So what they do to solve that problem is that they have this beautiful V in here, is they double write, their, their business logic is in here, and they double write the logic to a feature store, 
that is accessible in real time, and their more slow uh, kind of like big data world or uh, data warehouse in the current world. So in that way, so the logic is only in one place, but you still can serve in real time and still recover that data. Uh, so that's the online uh, in terms of get. Oh, sorry. Back. Um, so regarding the get data component, so the Basically, you have a data lake. Data lake is just a fancy name, I think, these days for <laughs> data warehousing. So where all the data of the company lands in a way that is uh, accessible to different uh, data processing jobs. So the data lake uh, contains um, most likely the metadata, uh, data quality assurance, and after the and, and feature generation as well. So from there, it goes to the Hive uh, feature for the for the Hive version of Feature Store. So it's basically a Hadoop uh, front-end uh, database, and uh, yeah, and that's basically it. And they also uh, collect the outcomes of the training process and uh, a sample of predictions. So the, the second stage is training models. So basically, these models are training in batch uh, with different training algorithms, and they have a, a model repository where they evaluate the best models, and actually it's basically an object store that can, after that, uh, send, deploy the models in two different places, because as you guys might know, there are two approaches to, to predictions in machine learning, like you either doing like real-time scoring or batch scoring. So batch scoring generally happens with tools like Spark and um, Flink and yeah, a couple of other uh, big data kind of tools. And on real time is generally fronted. Uh, all this is uh, fronted by APIs. So, but the same model is deployed in both cases. Uh, and most of these services, like the real-time prediction service, it's written once. You as a data scientist, you don't need to rewrite it. So your output is your model, and your model is packaged uh, and from engineering and uh, deployed. So this was kind of like, uh, yeah. And after that, you as a client, um, when you are requesting a ride, for instance, and trying to, to predict like how much time it will take, uh, from your mobile phone and your location and things like that. The features go directly to the prediction service. And uh, at this point, the, the, the prediction service also makes the correct call to the feature store. So this feature store is also like generally backed by DSLs, and it's very easy to access them from the, from the model. And yeah, so this is the prediction component in real time. And uh, in batch is very similar, and after that, the predictions go to Hive or Kafka. And there's a monitoring block here, sorry. Oh, sorry. Take this out. Okay. Okay, no problems. So this was uh, the first version of Michelangelo, but there was like recently, so that first version had a small problem. So most of the work was done by engineering. So the data scientists would provide uh, models or notebooks to engineers, and engineers would like deploy this system into the continuous deployment pipelines into the platform. So they noticed a couple of problems that probably a lot of companies have noticed, that like having this cycle not in control in the data science can be a friction point. And what they tried to do with a, a tool called PyML, so I think it has at most like one year or two years, one year and off, is actually giving the power to the, to the data scientists. So basically, from your normal Python tool, you can instrument deployment into Docker containers or, uh, and into uh, prediction services directly. Uh, so this is, oh, so there's a uh, last point is like just going a bit on detail on the Uber feature store. It's also an, another important, con important component. So they basically have a spec for features. The idea is that multiple teams in the same company can actually have like 
a central location for a feature that's re re relevant and predictive, and you can keep metadata around prediction power of that feature, so like, and make it discoverable as well. So I'll be very quickly on this one. This is, the, uh, I think, one of, uh, taken from a Facebook uh, blog. So they have a platform that has similar functionalities in general. Like, so it's always the platform approach to accelerate data science and machine learning systems. Uh, so there's also another interesting one from Airbnb. So very similar tools, you have a feature store, you have your big data component, and you have also like prediction services, and obviously, the, since they are the owners of Airflow, sorry, the creators of Airflow, there's a lot on Airflow and uh, uh, workflow orchestration in here. So, and this is like a simple uh, machine learning platforms comparison from uh, Microsoft. Uh, so they did a bunch of comparisons on different uh, uh, <laughs> open source tools. And uh, so one of the things that you can notice is the majority of the non-proprietary tools don't have the most important part, it's data management. So that was also an interesting point to me. And uh, yeah, that's the summary of the, of the survey of the different platforms uh, from big companies. They have much more com uh, survey, uh, platforms, but they kind of work in the same way. So since one of the principles was using software engineering principles and productionization is creating like this life cycle. So one of the, su the recent su suggestions is something called continuous delivery for ML. So it's basically creating a pipeline from model building and evaluation and experimentation, but everything in your continuous deployment environment, if you are making your, uh, let's say the model discovery or refitting your model with new parameters as part of your pipeline end to end. So one of the important things that you need to do is testing everywhere. So, for instance, like, uh, uh, let, let me just go back. So, uh, for instance, like, you have to test, for instance, the output of each of the systems, like, of your model, of your productionized model, and uh, obviously your deployment. You still need to use normal software engineering principles with canary testing, integration testing, and smoke, smoke testing. So, bringing all this machine learning, uh, software engineering practices of the last 20 years into this new machine learning world is critical for extracting value and being able to make the systems work. So this is another paper from the same team that of the hidden technical depth. It's just basically a rubric for scoring machine learning systems, so it can help you improve uh, your systems. So regarding the data, uh, like I'll start now with uh, t talking a, a bit about some tools. So tools that you can use for data lifecycle. So Delta Lake is an interesting tool from Databricks that you can actually version your data and treat your data uh, in some way a bit like code because it will be versioned by a, uh, by every time you make a change, it just creates a new version and you can actually track that version to your models as well. So DVC is also a very known tool for that particular problem. Uh, if you want to make sure that you, uh, that you, if you want to use, test the data, there's some uh, new interesting tools. DQ is from Amazon, so it allows you to test at scale, like assertions around data distributions, and it, uh, either from like training data or from uh, prediction data. And also Great Expectations, the fantastic uh, Python library as well that can be used for, to make these assertions in your machine learning pipelines, either in code or in your CI CD pipeline. Uh, there's a free, uh, kind of a very recent uh, open source feature store similar to Palette from Uber with the same ideas. It's called Feast. It's from a company called Gojek as well, but it works in a similar way than Palette from Uber feature store works. So I'll go to the, to, to the main topic. So I'll have to extend a bit <laughs> because I start a bit late. So what is ML Flow? So ML Flow helps you in specific components of your, of your machine learning pipeline. So the three important things that I would say is experimentation management, reproduce, re reproducibility, running your systems or your models version it, and you are able to run them at the same time, and standardization of ML projects and potentially uh, standardization of deployment operations. For, so from the same packaging system, you can deploy into Kubernetes, SageMaker, Azure ML, and Google Cloud, for instance. 
So it's kind of like instrumentation around your machine learning system. Uh, so what are the Im most important ML flow components? So there is an ML flow tracking. Basically, it's a, a module that record and query experiments, code, data, and configuration, and results. So while you're developing, even if you're developing in your notebook, you can start logging uh, your models, logging your data. You can log a hash of the data or the data in itself if it's small data. And configuration and results. So at that point, uh, it's basically a closure of all your ML system at that moment. It's version it, and you can use like whenever you want, and you can package it and make it available for deployment uh, and in different systems. So there's the ML flow projects components is basically the package standardization, and it's an important component. And ML flow models, it's the deployment component based on the fact that you uh, your project is uh, standardized. So there are multiple flavors of ML flow models, so you can decide. And the ML flow takes care of the abstraction of deploying on the right on the service that's more convenient to you, either Spark, either REST API or Azure ML. All of this is open source in Python. You can inspect the code, so, but it's, it's actually like something that allows you to go faster to production. This is a very complex uh, pipeline that I'll, I'll share with the slides as well. So it contains all the components and how would you use MLflow and a lot of the tools that we spoke about to uh, do important things like drift det detection, monitor your models, and deployment scoring, and model your pipelines. Uh, yeah, there won't be a demo, but anyway. So, <laughs> so I have a GitHub package that I've been playing around in the last couple of weeks with toy examples. Uh, the topic is really not very relevant, but it was just fun because we can have data coming all the time. So it's basically trying to predict Bitcoin price very easy. It's always going down. So, uh, <laughs> so, so this is a, the toy example that I'll show you, like, and how to basically use uh, ML flow for this particular example. Uh, so you have an ML project, and you can go and look at the, at, at the repo now. So this is like the toy example. Like you just specified the name of the project. You specified the environment. You can actually have Docker or, uh, yeah, I think you can do it as a packaging. It can be Anaconda or Docker. And you can also have like uh, entry points. You can actually orchestrate a very complex pipeline on this component. And this is your standard conda file. If your packaging strategy was Docker, you would have like to have your Docker file. So I basically use your Python, scikit-learn, MLflow flow as well, pandas and data reader. So when you save your model, it also saves with these dependencies, whatever is the version of your model that you used. And there's, there, will, there will always also be a GitHub uh, repo a hash that you can always go back to that specific version. And this is like a very simple pipeline. Sorry. So you basically train your data, you acquire your training data, you just have to make sure that you are using the width MLflow start run. So MLflow struts and, and, and turns down. So you acquire training data, you prepare training data, uh, and there's some code to just do some feature transformation in here. And you have like a classifier, like the random forest classifier. And um, you fit your model, you predict, and then the most important part is you log your model. So with this logging of your model, it will log the pico of your model automatically, depending on the format. If you're using TensorFlow, PyTorch, or SKLearn in this case, it will persist in the correct way that it can be loaded automatically. So with this, just with this piece of code, a like uh, all the deployment mechanisms are available to you. So I'll show you probably, uh, yeah. How does it work? So if you do a run, it will just execute training and log your experiment and create a new model with all the de dependencies available to you. And at the same time, uh, so this is how the MLflow infrastructure looks like. It's just a UI where you can have your metrics and you can compare. It's pretty cool. So you can actually inspect each, ver each run of your system. Uh, yeah, each run of your system, there's a run ID, there's a git commit, so you can go back to the specific code point. <laughs> I'll hear some, more, some minutes from the questions. Thank you. 
so yeah, the source, duration, entry point, what's the command that you run, that exact version. Every time that you run, it creates a new version with dependencies and things like that, and you can compare all your metrics, and you have artifacts in here. Uh, what's this? Okay, so I'll explain the artifacts. The artifacts are basically uh, the, your model, your dependencies, your Docker file, everything that allows the, the system to run it independently, that particular version of your model. So just with that few lines of code and few configuration, you now have an API that you can actually use for an MVP in a production system. And you basically, because like the smartness of MLflow is actually transforming your code that will be in, for instance, in a notebook or it can be actually in code, like you have already logged the model, so it's available for the, for the prediction service to serve it correctly. You just, in order to serve, you just need to run this command, and you have a REST API that you can curl directly, and it will give you a result that you can use in your application. So it's a very fast way to iterate for data scientists. So if they really want to, from day one, they can have an API that it's a model. It can be de deployed uh, with some <laughs> uh, infrastructure still, but it can be easily testable, and like if if the model actually uh, is profitable and makes sense for the company, then like, more work can be done. And in the same way, you can do champion challenging with this approach, because since you have like, all the tagging, and uh, you can actually run two models at the same time, and test and log the metrics and see which of them is better and decide. Uh, so the last part is how would you do predictions monitoring? So it's very simple, so you have your runtime, so you log your model, MLflow, you load your, your model from MLflow, you predict, and you log predictions in Delta Lake. Delta Lake is just like a data lake, uh, the data lake, uh, data lake tool. And you can compare, and you can mon monitor drift and alert with your normal like, elastic search and Grafana tools. So this is an example of a dashboard of predictions, so with alerts and probably pager duty, if it makes sense. And uh, I'll forget about this example, but it's, uh, an, again, a, another example in the NLP section, but I don't think we have time. Cool. So, into, there's more time? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so this is another example of a project that I've done and I've used uh, MLflow. It was just like a collaborative project in an organization called Omden, and we were trying to do a text classifier for uh, to, to assess risk of PTSD. It's a complex story, but basically there's a chatbot and there is like a uh, like a set of, uh, of the dialogue of the text. And one of the things that, one of the challenges that we had in that is that we had 35 engineers writing machine learning models. And we needed to do it in a quick way, in a way that we could just verify what was the best model. So one of the tools that we used for that project was actually MLflow to actually assess the best model and use the best model in the end. So it's also like very simple. So here you have a very, like this is an example of one of the models. So you have a very simple pipeline that does TFID with text, and it has a logistic regression. So the cool thing here is because you log the pipeline, so the data transformation is already embodied on your API call automatically. So there's a lot of magic here. It's impressive. Uh, so yeah, and you just need like five lines of code to uh, put your model, to, to actually log your model and deploy. And this is like uh, the the platform that we use to try to find the best models. And this is, again, the tracking and versioning part that we discuss it. And this is the serving layer as well, again. Uh, and you can choose multiple backends. You can do it in batch with Spark, or in this case, as, with, as a REST API. And this is an example of a call. And you just, uh, and you basically, the call format here is the pandas data frame. So you just wire a pandas data frame in JSON format. So because you loaded the pipeline, it's able to do the transformation for you for free without doing any code. And yeah, it can be deployed and tested and integrated with many systems. So summary-wise, from all this research and uh, playing around for these tools for the last year, uh, so yeah, so it's still painful to move from development to production, but these tools do promise a lot. And I've used in a couple of circles as that the tools like that I mentioned were useful. Uh, so the ML ecosystem is very recent, as everyone knows, and frameworks are still maturing. So a lot of these frameworks are 
not even version or version one something or before version one. So we need to be patient and send pull requests as well. Uh, DevOps and standard software engineering practices are like the key to get value out of these systems at large scale. And one important thing is having cross-functional teams working on, M on, a, on ML projects at the same time is also one extremely valuable thing. So you can have data scientists and uh, production engineers in the same uh, boat. That is basically it. So that's basically it. Questions? Thank you very much. Um, the following talk has been delayed to 11.50. It's now starting at 11.50. Um, and the schedule change has now been updated on the website, so please refresh if you want to see what the changes are. Um, and now we have time for a couple of questions. Um, we need someone, a second person with the second microphone, maybe, on, on this side of the room. Um, so please put up your hand if you have a question. Wait for the microphone and speak directly into the microphone, not you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, with re regards to um, like the like data management and model management and stuff, during that experimentation phase, where you know you you iterating through different model architectures and hyperparameters, um, does MLflow cater for the storage of um, metrics in the sense of like let's say you have multiple confusion matrices per experiment that you've run? Um, is that something that's also catered for? Yeah, so at the same time, you can uh, log multiple models. So th the concept there is kind of an abstract concept, is an artifact. So within an artifact, a type of an artifact is a model, and you can have multiple artifacts logged for one exact run, and multiple metrics associated to each artifact, so you can compare. And you can log also random reports, including confusion matrix and things like that. Okay, awesome, thanks. Do you have other questions? Gentleman here. Hi, thanks. Uh, congratulations. Awesome talk. Um, you went very quickly over that section where you showed the actual code. Where Sorry? You, the, uh, sure, sure, sure. Which code? So, so there was, the, like, initially where you showed, uh, like, how you define which metrics to log and so on. I think it was the very first example of code. Okay, uh, cool, maybe sure. that one. So what other other like on in the ML flow package? I mean, like what other? So you've got SK Learn there, but like what other maybe machine uh, learning libraries? TensorFlow, or? PyTorch. Uh, I don't remember from the top of, of my head, but the most important one. So ON, ON and X for and PMMLs as well. So basically the standard ones that you had that you would expect, and you should be able to log and and you can also log your own as well. Like if they pick it, but the problem is that it won't give you all the benefits, <laughs> or you'll have to write the classes. But the standard ones that you're used in machine learning in production, let's say 80% of them, like PMML, ONNX, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Keras, obviously, and... Yeah, they're, they're all okay covered. There. And then apart from the functions that you showed there, yeah. uh, like the log metric, is there other, like, so rich yes, functions? Yes, uh, log artifacts, log, uh, log artifacts, log parameters, so all of these things are handled in a different way. Okay. But awesome. I think for me the brilliant function is the log model in some way because it logs your model, like the binary of your model, and your dependencies at the same time, okay. including your GitHub uh, details and your exactly hash commit as well. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. And we can do another question. Hi there. Um, so I prefer to learn from other people's mistakes without making them on my own. So I was wondering, what was the biggest mistake you guys made during this whole uh, journey of productionizing your ML models? Uh, biggest mistake? Yes. Sure. The one I shouldn't be making. <laughs> I think not have, having monitoring, just deploying your models and expecting for the best. I think this is probably the most important thing. Because these things don't behave as you expect if you don't look at them. <laughs> So I think monitoring is probably the first mistake that we have all made. And one more. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. There we go. Uh, how long does it take to train one of these? You know, how long does it take to train? It all depends on the data that you have. So it's very, like, so this, uh, like, these examples are very 
are very fast, but like the one involving data, uh, text data, because I had a thousand examples would take like 20 minutes. But it takes a lot of time, and it all depends on your infrastructure. It doesn't do anything smart. It's just a, a smart collection of exi existing libraries. So, okay, and uh, well, what is the most complicated one you've created? <laughs> yeah, I think none of them are very complicated. <laughs> I think probably the NLP one, because we had to do it with UML fit as well, and that was quite hard because it was not provided. So fast AI is one type of model that's not available straight on, and we had to do a lot of coding to make it available in there. And I think we can squeeze in one more question. Anyone? Yeah, so uh, thank you for your talk. Um, it's very, this is very useful just to um, get my ideas going and like get us exposed to this. What I want to know though is, this is one, you've shown us how you can interact with the API. What I want to know is, um, firstly I want to know how many of these have you actually implemented, all right? Oh, hard and, question. Then, and then the second question always with this is, once you've exposed the API, you almost want to use that data in your next set of training data, you know? So you want to get feedback from it, and I want to know how you how you incorporated that in the process. Oh, um, okay. So a lot about just the productionization of it, you know, because this is great to test something out. But my question is always when you get a developer in to come and productionize it now. That's when the trouble starts, you know. Yeah, and I don't think the the trouble actually ends. So, <laughs> so basically, uh, like you'll be calling it from a context. So within this context, you can always log it like the result of your prediction. That's one approach. So it will be called either from the command line and you can log exactly the prediction and the feature set that you used. And it becomes like a table somewhere else that you can. So it's built into the yeah, yeah, you need to build in. No, this part you need to code because this is your, your own code. It's how you use the system. So like, yeah, monitoring is still lacking. Like you need to write it uh, like by itself. Or use existing tools like how, how many have you implemented? How big is that? Uh, so, yeah, it's, this is very recent. So the one that I've used in a real project was actually the NLP example. And but there are a couple of projects ongoing in the company. So one is the answer, but it's being used in the industry. Yeah. Okay, that's all the questions we have time for. Uh, it's time to go to the next session. Um, yeah, so Thank please you. check the schedule for the schedule changes and next talk starts at 11.15.